office. So let's rewind a little bit and like back into college. Where'd you go to school and kind of what's that story? Sure. So I went to Union College uh, in upstate New York. I'm proud to say I'm on the board there now. Um, Union's one of the oldest colleges in the country. It was founded in 1795. It was one of the first schools that integrated liberal arts and engineering. Mm -hmm. It's always been a very creative school. And so I was, I, I call myself a prototypical Union College graduate in that I was a political science and a math major. So really firmly in that kind of liberal arts and STEM education. And the most important thing that happened to me there, it was really the, the pivotal part of my life, is I took a term abroad and I yeah. went to study in Japan. I wanted to go to somewhere as different from America as I could. I really wanted to go to China. Yeah. Um, they did not yet have a term abroad in China. And so I went to Japan and it-, it Where were you in Japan? Uh, I, I actually didn't live in Tokyo. I lived in a really small town between Osaka and Kyoto. Okay. So it, um, it was called Hirakatashi. Okay. And which was great because there were very few uh, foreigners, very few Americans there. So yeah. you really were forced to learn the language and find a way to assimilate into the culture. Japan is my favorite country in the world by far to go to. Yeah. Um, it's a special place. It really is. And the thing I loved about it was the culture there is still so palpable. It isn't. It hasn't become so westernized. Yeah that it's ubiquitous, you go there and you still feel how, how deeply their cultural roots and are the present. The crazy thing is you can speak not a word of Japanese and you can basically go anywhere in the country, transportation's amazing, the people are great. People are kind, it's clean, it's safe. It is a really, really special place. So yeah. then um, coming out of, coming back to the US, maybe, I guess to finish college, and then you went to NYU to get your JD. Why right. did you study law? So I knew I was going to be a lawyer from the time I was a little girl. In fact, when I was eight years old, I wrote my first contract. Um, no lie, my mother gave me the contract as a as a Christmas gift three years ago, and it's it a labor contract with your par with your parents. What? Like, nah. Did not do more than four hours of chores. It was not that. I was a very commercial person. Even then, I negotiated. Uh, it says the party of the first part hereby agrees to buy the party of the second part a new lunchbox. <laughs> I kid you not. And my mother, I made my mother sign and I had my first client who was my little sister and I negotiated <laughs> a new lunchbox for her as well. So I knew from the time I was very young that I wanted to be a lawyer. So I went straight to law school out of college. Do you still have a picture of that? Or the oh, my mother framed it for me. I have... I have a, okay. yeah, yeah, it's, have a yeah, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, and after law school, I went to work for Milbank Tweed. And the reason I wanted to go to, to work for Milbank was because of my experience in Japan. Milbank was the firm after World War II, the only firm that had a license to practice in Japan. Oh, cool. So I wanted to work for them. I hoped there was a way for me to get back there. But I ended up doing project finance for them. I was one of few women doing it. And uh, they used to call me the Teflon associate because everything <laughs> would just slide off my back. I just would kind of put my head down. You know, obviously building power plants is a very male dominated industry. And so you have to really learn to roll with the punches there. But I love doing project finance. I, you know, it's very complicated. And so I felt like once you got your mind around how to build a power plant, you could do almost anything. So all of these experiences, having gone to Japan, worked in project finance, which I knew nothing about, helped me gain confidence. Um, and I'm really glad that I took those opportunities. And then how I- How were you there? I was at Millbank uh, for four years, yeah. and then I got recruited to go in-house to Prudential Insurance Company. To be their in-house counsel for a particular To be group. part of their, their, their legal team doing project finance, supporting their power uh, finance department, which was quite large. Insurance companies, people think infrastructure is kind of a new asset class. Insurance companies have been investing in infrastructure for decades because it's a long tail investment. The, the, the liabilities match up with the assets very well. And, and for context, when was this? This, I would join them in 1993. Okay. And then by 96, I had moved over to the private equity group uh, as counsel and I was getting recruited away uh, actually to go join one of my former clients, uh, Scythe Energies, which became a Blackstone portfolio company, of all things. Um, but anyway, we, um, uh, I ended up joining the private equity group, and then uh, when I got recruited away, my Peru said, don't leave. We'll take you to the business side. And so they gave me the opportunity to become the head of product development in their private equity group. And in 1999, uh, a couple partners and myself started the customized fund investment group within Prudential, which provided customized investment portfolios for big institutional investors. What was that like? I mean, how did you decide to come up with that 
idea and your partners and just like what is the founding chapter of CFIG? Yeah, it's, it's actually a really great story because there were a few other fund of funds at the time. Um, uh, you know, HarborVest uh, was, was started then, um, and uh, I think Abbott Capital was around, and um, Adam Street, they're, it's precursor. But there weren't a lot, but most of them were doing commingled fund of funds. So y you and a hundred other investors invest in the same product. And my partner, who had been with a, a state pension plan, really was focused on the idea of saying, look, we need to custom design things. Each pension plan, each institutional investor has their own needs and they don't want to be in one size fits all kind of ubiquitous pool. They want something. And so it was really his idea coming from the client side. Um, and that's always the approach we took was really trying to look at things from the client side, not necessarily what we wanted to sell them, but yeah. what they wanted to buy. I mean, it's, you know, kind of business 101. And that resonated in the marketplace. And we were one of the first groups to really focus on doing customization. And what was interesting about that is we always joked that we did the things that other people didn't want to do. So a lot of what we did was focus on investing with small and emerging managers. A lot of our clients... Because of the time it took to find out their story, their track record, and right. all the effort to right. do that. And it, again, we started in 99. This was yeah. during the first tech bubble. For a lot of institutional investors, they were very focused on how do I get into these top tier VC funds. You know, by the time they're big, I can't get in. So we were focusing on, look, you know, on looking for those, those uh, uh, diamonds in the rough. But we became known for a specialty in investing with small and new managers, which has a different risk profile. And a lot of our competitors would actually refer funds over to us. They would say, oh, well, we don't do that, but go see CFIG. And because we developed that expertise, a lot of clients started to ask us to look at diverse managers as well, women and minority-led funds, because very often they were small yeah. and they were new. And so we developed a whole practice around investing in diverse emerging managers, and we, we became really the market leader in doing that. And you know, I feel very fortunate that I got to do that because it's very rare in your Wall Street career that you get to do something that matches up so perfectly with your value your system. Yeah. I, I feel so blessed and, and to have had the partners that I work with who, who all you know, coalesced around that and to work with you know, incredible clients. Um, and then about... Uh, 11 years ago, um, I was at the very first Women's Private Equity Summit, and which was held in Half Moon Bay. Uh, my dear friend Beth Falk started that, and a group of us, Robin Painter and Jill Kitazaki and myself, helped her kind of put the conference together. And Denise Napier was the keynote speaker. She flew all the way across the country. She was, at the time, the state treasurer of the state of Connecticut, the first African-American female state treasurer in the country. And she held up a copy of Portfolio Magazine, which was a Connie Nass publication. And on the front cover, it had an article that said, the women of private equity, and in parentheses, and yes, there are only four of them. Oh, and so after the collective <laughs> gasp in the, com in the, in the, the room, which was, there were about 150 women in the room at the very first and conference. Was it, in, in, for the first conference, was it focused on you know just large managers, or is it just women in private equity if you meet those two criteria, please come, let's figure this out. It was out. pretty much women in private equity if you meet those two criteria. <laughs> we, you know, now, today, it's, you can't get into the conference. Yeah. I mean, it is, it is, uh, there's a huge wait list to get into Beth's conferences. But at the time, it was, re she had been, her story is actually an interesting one. You know, she had been at another institution that did conference organization, and she'd always wanted to do a women's conference. And they said, like, who's going to show up for that? And so she went out and started Falk Marquez Group and, and proved that, yeah, there are women in the industry and they want to be together. And it was very funny when Denise uh, Napier gave her keynote speech. She said, you know, one of my really big private equity managers is over in the Middle East and he heard I was going to keynote this conference. And he called me up and he's like, do I need to be there? He, she, she said he got a little nervous that all these women were kind of getting together. <laughs> and... Um, but anyway, she, she challenged us. She said, you cannot allow articles like this to be written. And, um, and so a group of us got together and said, we really need to pull together the senior women in the industry. We need to know each other, the women who are decision makers, who can pull the trigger on things. We need to know each other. We need to do business together. 
and we need to increase the profile of women in this industry. We can't allow articles like that to be written. And that was the genesis of the Private Equity Women Investor Network, PEWIN. Um, How many people were kind of part of that? Early group to kind of there were 12 around. women around the table, uh, literally around a table. One of the one of the women hosted like tea in her offices. Yeah. It was so quintessentially like female get together. <laughs> but um, but out of that, today we have uh, going on 700 members globally. We have chapters all over the United States. We're about to open a chapter in Canada. We have a chapter in Asia. We have a chapter in London. I'm just back a couple weeks ago from the, our London annual meeting. Yeah. Um, it's, it's actually European. And then we have a fairly big chapter in Africa. How, um, what percentage of the 700 are in the U.S.? I would say it's probably right now about 80% in the U.S. It's still very U.S. dominated for a variety of reasons, no surprise. But um, I would say our fastest growing chapter is in Europe. Uh, as more and more women get promoted there, the good work of groups like Level 20 who are working on getting women into senior positions. Um, and we are about 60% limited partners, 40% general partners. That, that swings back and forth annually, but we try to keep pretty much a 50-50 mix of LPs and GPs. And What is that process to get in, to apply? Is It's, it's more than just female plus private equity, right. um, but now now what are, like how do you actually think about the members you want to bring in? Yeah, you know, we thought long and hard about it because there are other women's networks that have obviously been very successful over time that started, you know, with a number in their name, like 100 women in hedge funds and ended up being 100,000 women. And that gets a little overwhelming. We, we really wanted to have a curated group because we wanted to be impactful for each other and on the industry. And so, the, the word investor in our name is very important. You, it, most of our members are investors. We focus on people in investment roles, either on the LP or GP side. We do have some you know, people in legal roles, people in fundraising and, and investor relations roles, but the vast majority are in investment roles. You have to be sponsored to be a member, so it's, it's not just open doors. We're very welcoming and we're happy to have people, but um, again, it's important because we want to make sure people meet the criteria so that the experience that the members have within the network is meaningful. And um, like I said, we've just seen dramatic growth, particularly in the last couple of years. Um, we, um, and about three years ago, uh, we partnered with the American uh, Investment Council, AIC, which used to be the Private Equity Growth Capital Council. Okay. It's the trade organization that represents private equity firms in the industry. And NAIC, the National Association of Investment Companies, which works with diverse managers to, on a women's initiative. They wanted to sponsor a women's initiative to look at what did the industry need to do to encourage more women to be in the industry and to stay in the industry. What are some of the facts and figures around women and private equity or um, just kind of general investing? I think when I did an interview with Lauren from Middle Ground, the data point we had was 1% of the 2,300 North American buyout funds had female founders or co-founders. Um, I don't know what the, if I perfectly characterize like the dimensions of that, but that's generally the point is like, by private, 2,300 private equity firms, only 1% have female founders or co-founders. Right. What are some of the other uh, data points that you've seen that would be kind of helpful, just kind of, um, you know, dimensionalize the issue? Yeah, I think to me the most important one is that, you know, regardless of when you look at the number over the last decade, I think the number of senior women hovers between seven and nine percent and it goes up and it goes down and and it but it, it doesn't private equity venture capital that's mutual funds. that's private equity i mean um it's it's not mutual funds it's not hedge funds it's really private equity and what's to me instructive about that is a couple things one is that um despite the fact that there's a lot of focus being uh, paid to the bottom of the funnel, meaning recruiting, getting yeah. the pipeline to be robust and getting more women to come into the you're industry. 25, 24, 25 year old, maybe did two years of banking, now you're an associate at some type of right. you know, lower middle market. So, and, and, and even younger than that, I mean, um, Girls Who Invest, which is an incredible organization, which is based on girls who code, 
and trying to educate women about the possibility of a career in finance and preparing them to become analysts in private equity and hedge fund firms. Um, they're doing a great job with high school age girls. Okay. You know, you really have to get people interested. Because that in determines it. what they study in college, exactly. and then they have the mentors throughout college. Right, to say, hey, and we'll then what internships years. they get during college, and all the things that that guys seem to be trained on, and they realize that that investment is a career path for them. Women are not taught that investment is a career path for them, and so that's what girls who invest does. They do an incredible job. Um, Janet Cowell, who's the former state treasurer of North Carolina, is the CEO. Uh, and Seema Hingarani, who was the um, chief investment officer for New York City Retirement Systems, is the founder. And it, it's an amazing organization. But a lot, so a lot of focus is paid there, but the numbers at the top don't move. They, they just sort of hover at just below 10%. And I think that is one of the most important issues. It's part of the reason why PE Win was founded, because if you don't keep women in the industry, if you don't have senior women, if junior women can't see senior women who've made it and figured out how to navigate what I call you know, the three-dimensional chess of a career in finance, they're not gonna stay. They're gonna, you know, they're gonna be parts, times in their career where it gets really dicey and it's hard and they don't, if there are no senior women in their firms or senior women in the industry for them to talk to, yeah. they're gonna give up. And they get maybe 33 to 35, they might or might not have their first cup, a child, might be on, uh, you know, family's on a number two, and then you get mid-career and thinking, what the heck am I doing? Like, do I actually want to be a partner? I'm tired of, like, where's my career going? Is this worth it? Do I want to exit stage right and do something else with my career if I decide to come back? Because I haven't had the female leaders who are 10 years ahead of me to say, like, you'll get through this. Right here's the path, here's how I did it, now go talk to five other women at this conference, here's what they did. Right. Is that, exactly. so how do we solve the problem of kind of mid-career exits? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, that's part of the, the question that we undertook as part of this women's initiative. And I, so I chaired it, I, I had a group of women who uh, worked on the steering committee with me, and we came up, we had four, four work streams, recruiting, retention, um, gender-related policies and infrastructure. So these were all recommendations that firms should take in order to help retain, recruit and retain women in the industry. And you know, some of the important things we, we suggested are around you know, family leave policies, feeling very strongly that it has to be family leave and not just maternity leave. You just saw the case at JP Morgan where men who were not allowed to take parental leave won a major financial award for that. Until we destigmatize de the idea of taking leave, whether you're a man or a woman, it's going to be a big issue for women. Part of the issue for women in private equity is that, um, you know, I call this, it, it's not a secret because it's open, but no one talks about it. Private equity firms, by their design, are family offices. People think of them as corporations and they expect them to have corporate governance, but they don't. In general, you have a couple of guys who work together at an investment bank or they work together at another private equity firm. They spin out, they start a firm, they invest a lot of their personal net worth in the firm to get it stood up, and then they keep a lot of their net worth in that firm over time. And so they, you know, it's very identified with them. And it is not run like a corporation. There aren't boards of directors. You know, there are not the kind of oversight that you have at a corporate, like a big bank if you work there. And so a lot of firms, when they're founded, they don't have parental leave policies because it's all guys. Yeah. And so many women, you know, once guys sort of say, look, we really need to get more women into this firm, they don't realize that if you haven't, a, if you haven't envisioned a firm with women in it, until you start to recruit a woman, you're gonna have a very hard time recruiting a woman because you probably haven't set the infrastructure up in your firm to make it easy for her to thrive and make it easy to her, for her to have success. I never thought about that practical dynamic of how this private equity firm you know, operates as basically as a family office. Number one, I haven't been exposed as much in day to day, but also because I'm male having thought about that context of Oh, man. You know, start processing right now. Yeah. No, and, and it is it is a bit of a like, you know, yeah. mind blowing thing when you think about it. And and I, look, I'm sympathetic to it as a founder. I mean, I, my my firm I founded inside a, a corporation, but 
you know, when you're a founder and you're working hard and you're raising the money and you're doing the deals and, you know, and you, all your money is tied up in this firm, you do want to protect it and you want to protect the culture you've built because it's the culture that's created success. Um, and so when you start to bring in people who are different from you are, you're starting to bring in women, you're starting to bring in pre people of color, you know, the idea that those founders might flip the keys to someone who's very different from them and who hasn't been socialized in the same way is a tough one. And so for women to succeed in these firms, to get into that inner circle where you're having conversations about how the firm is growing, you're having conversations about who's getting hired and fired, you're having conversations about compensation is hard. But until women get brought into the inner circles of those uh, of those conversations, the culture of these firms is not going to change. And so back to your original question is, you have mid-career women, they're having their first child or maybe having their second child, and they're saying, you know, am I going back? I always tell people, in my 25 years in private equity, I've never met a woman who left private equity to have children. They never leave for that. They don't come back because they don't want to come back to the culture in the firm where they were because they say look before I had these kids my deal I wasn't you know my deals weren't getting approved I wasn't having a say on you know cultural aspects of the firm um, I wasn't being included in social events yeah. and so now you I have this casual like Thursday golf you want to come Right. Hey, we're going to go to Scotland. There's big golf. Or hey, let's we're going to go smoke cigars. Or you know, and it, I don't think it's done intentionally. It's 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 decades of cultural activities, right? Um, that builds up and creates that structure. Totally, and it's well worn paths that have worked. That that's why I say, you know, when you create a culture where you're having success, if you're posting, you know, thirty percent net IRRs, why do you want to mess with that, to. right? And so so it's understandable. But the idea that bringing women or pe people of color into that culture is going to make it worse is, is so wrong. And there are ways to, to you know, make the changes to make everybody feel comfortable and make people feel like they have a voice and are contributing. Um, and I say this as a female founder who was very successful. I mean, we raised $30 billion. We, clients trusted us. We did a good job. And, you know, part of... What I always say to people is, I think having women involved in that culture, whether creating it from the beginning as a founder, I feel very strongly about women founding their own firms, or being part of that fabric makes things better for men and women. Because, you know, men want to have a chance to be with their families. Men want to be good husbands. They want to be good spouses. They, they don't yeah. want to be looked down upon because they say, hey, I want to take three months off and be home with my new baby or it comes back to the cultural expectations for the entire industry mm -hmm. and how we operate you know like it, it, it actually hit me recently when I was home on the weekend and I was doing something simple just folding clothes and I realized I haven't done something like this and spent this just calm time with the family and our little toddler is helping out to, to fold the mm -hmm. clothes and I just realized like it's so much of our day to day is just on the go or answering emails at 10 p.m., 11 or 12 a.m. And then the expectations of that even for me and then when you have it across the whole family and that's just whole structure, that system is like it's just not healthy. Right. And if, if I'm, if I operate that, you know, generally six years of investment banking and then that continues throughout my career, like something has to give to have a successful family right. and who's going to give. Right. Well, and my view is, again, from trained as a lawyer, looking at risk management, especially when you have a private equity firm, which is a partnership, um, it is really important that you want your partners to have stable home lives. That, that to me, I mean, look at how many private equity firms have blown up because there's one partner who's living, you know, yeah. living large and, and he, he's a player and he gets in some kind of trouble and it blows the firm up. And you have fights in divorces over the equity share and the partnership. Um, you have, you know, investors who lead, you know, who want out. They, you, you have removal of the GP because they've done something inappropriate. I mean, it's, it is a risk management tool. And so as a founder, you want to think about that. And to me, I think we all should be saying, how do we construct a, a, a culture so that everyone can be a good spouse and be a good partner because they're going to be happier 
they're going to be more loyal if they have a culture where they feel like they're being valued and their home life and their family is being valued as part of the equation. And that means FaceTime isn't important. Like you don't have to be in the office every day. If you're smart and you can do your job from home, then do it from do it from wherever you need to do it. If you are, um, you know, if you are, if you need to leave because your kid has a soccer game, who cares? Because yeah. you're a responsible person. You're going to get back online at nine this o'clock. This is like the exact same thing that we've heard at Middle Ground. Like this exact culture. And so we've been going. We went to their Kentucky office. They're, they have a New York headquarters and a Kentucky headquarters. We also, the really, really interesting thing that hit us when we were doing these video interviews is that we went to their portfolio companies and we hear even the machinists using the same words to describe that portfolio company's culture. Mm -hmm. And then we look at each other thinking, this is exactly what Middle Ground said, that how they built their fund. And that goes down to the companies that they buy and it's part of the whole organization mm -hmm. and part of the culture. Yeah. Yeah, I personally I think it's the secret sauce. It to me it it, it intuitively it just makes so much sense. And I but I also say it as a founder because you know, in my firm, the people who most often took advantage of flexible work arrangements were my male partners because they had wives with big careers or they chose um, to live outside the New York City area. And so they had to commute, so they might work from home on Mondays or Fridays or both. And from my perspective, if you'd made it to that level in the firm, you know how to do your job. I don't need to be hovering over you. There's no reason for you to be in the office if you can get things done. And everybody was all hands to the pump when things needed to get done. Hire smart people, trust them, and everyone works And empower the them. And, and so, you know, I, I think that it creates a much better uh, outcome as an investor. Um, because you have people, I think when you create a culture where people feel valued, they feel very responsible for that firm. And regardless and, of the level, an administrator all the way up to the partner. Absolutely. I mean, I used to say to people, I, I want to view my firm, no matter how many people work here, as a mom and pop shop. And I want everybody here to know that if they need me to make copies, I'm going to make photocopies. If we're working on a project, we have to be here all night. You know, I'll be the one to go out and get coffee. I don't care. I want everybody to feel an ownership mentality, and the way you can't do that unless people feel like the culture values them, and that they that the way they need to operate at their best is part of the fabric of the firm. And so I think it's really important if firms that are established by men recognize from the beginning, as soon as they set the firm up. Put your family leave policies in place. Put other policies in place. Because it sets the tone for everything Sets the else. tone and it helps to signal to women that we have been anticipated as part of this firm from its beginning. Even if we weren't here when the firm was started, this firm thought about a world in which they would have female partners around the table helping to make decisions. And, and we want to make it easier for them to do that. And I think, you know, I, I, but I feel very strongly about more women's founding their own firms because I what think... What are the numbers? Like how many, in, in, if you just look at North American buyout funds, like how many are actually female founded? It's it, very it, few. You could probably... Like sub, you, below 25? It, it's probably... It's certainly below 50. Okay. Um, and but but I will tell you in the last five years it's changed dramatically. There are a lot there are a lot more funds on the VC side that are founded by women. Um, on the Why bio side, I, I just think that the you know the, the way you come to become a venture capitalist is not necessarily through an investment yeah, banking yeah. route. Like Being you, a successful startup founder, which is much right. more. You've worked in in biz dev inside a, yeah. a tech company, so there the the pipeline there is more robust. Hmm. Whereas. Um, Whereas in the private equity side, there's a very you know, well-worn path of you go to work for an investment bank, then you go work for a private equity firm, then you become a partner, then you leave. Yeah. The other issue for women is that you know, there's a pay gap in private equity as there is in any other industry for, uh, on a gender basis because um, you know, what people get paid, what, how much carry they get depends on, in many cases, on what their deal flow is like. Women routinely report that they have a hard time getting their deals approved inside of firms because again culturally they're not socializing their deals in the same way they don't necessarily get the same airtime as, as the guys do and so and the you whole know, ecosystem of 
hey, I've done 10 deals with this person in my career, and then when it goes to IC, it's lower risk, faster approval. Right, yeah. Oh, yes, exactly. Um, and, and, and so if you haven't banked a lot of money in that 10 years of your career when you're ready to walk out the door and start your firm because you're going to go without being paid for probably three years before you get to stand that fund up, uh, that's a problem. So if women are making less than men, when they go to take the risk of founding their own firm, they don't necessarily have that war chest in the same way that the guys do. So that's also a very important thing. And I think that's part of why you've seen fewer women do that. But the good news is more women are doing it. More women are having great success at doing it. And one of the things we did coming out of this women's initiative was to say, look, we're going to give you all these recommendations on how you can do a better job of recruiting and retaining women inside your, your existing private equity firms. But let's assume, despite your very best efforts, that doesn't happen. We also want to have a path for women to stay in the industry by starting their own firms. And so we started an initiative called Project Pink Light which was my kind of riff on a green lighting a, a film. It's pink lighting a fund. And it's really meant to be an accelerator program for women who want to start their own funds. We want to sort of get them out on the right foot. We want to make sure that their first foray into the marketplace to raise capital is a positive one. And so we kind of run them through a boot camp of, you know, how do you create... It's an accelerator program for women to do private equity funds. Yes and to be founders. And so um, the first two funds that went through it had you know, huge success on, on, on a relative basis for how much capital they were raising. Um, the first one was uh, Kinsey Capital, which Suzanne. is Suzanne Yoon, who has been reported this week, has had her final closing. She yeah. had to reopen the fund because more people wanted to come in. She's been doing so well. She's been amazing. She's amazing. She's part of our... Um, Elite Meat nonprofit in Chicago has just been like a kind of a cornerstone of our nonprofit there, and we're we're gonna do a vlog interview with her tomorrow um, at a conference. Uh, and what was the second fund? Second fund is Prelude Growth. So um, uh, Netta Dinajda, um, who was a partner at El Catterton, yeah. uh, focus on uh, global health and beauty, um, is one of the founders there, and. I love that story because I cannot say enough good things about El Catterton and the way they han handled it. And I tell everybody who will listen to me, this is what you need to do. There's so much focus in the industry from the limited partner perspective on the lack of women at private equity firms. And I keep saying to people, look, you may or may not be able to keep women in your firm, but if they want to leave, help them <laughs> do it in a way that you set them up for success don't what don't feel betrayed when the woman says she wants that to should be a success story that should be a success story and you should do in fact what el catterton did which is to say look you've been a great partner you've made us money we're putting our own money behind you our right. personal money we're also going to help to introduce you to limited partners. We're going to give you some office space. I mean, I feedback on deal flow, feedback on the fundraise. To me, and, as a limited partner, when I look at that, I'm going to give them credit yeah. for helping or not giving them a demerit for losing a female partner. I'm going to give them credit. I, I, I always call it kind of the Julian Robertson approach of having the Cubs out there. Yeah. I think that's the way to do it, to say, be proud that your progeny are out there, particularly if it's women or people of color, and be proud that you're standing them up in a, in a fund where they're going to make create their own wealth and their own culture I think that's a win for everybody so Netta uh, and Prelude and um, and Suzanne with Kinsey that were the first two funds to go through we've now had uh, what does that actually mean for the accelerator like how's it structured and we, we have uh, 10 minutes or five minutes yeah we so. it's structured so we have a panel of LPs and GPs uh, and most of the GPs are uh, their founders they're women founders um, we, they meet with the fund, the fund comes in and gives a cold pitch and we basically give them feedback on um, the pitch itself but also the structure of the firm. We also give them what we call a toolkit which um, provides references to law firms to help them set the firm up. Uh, it provides um, information about firms, uh, about investors who will invest with first time women led funds. It provides information about how to answer um, a questionnaire. 
So, and if, you know, LPs and consultants give these questionnaires to managers to fill out and we put them in a position to say, look, fill this whole thing out before you go ask for one, you know, one dime. Because if you can answer all the questions in these questionnaire, yeah. it, first of all, you'd be very impressive that you've done it. And second of all, you will be prepared for almost any question that is thrown your way. And so that's a, we've spent a lot of time helping um, the funds get through that. But to date, we've had um, eight firms go through. In fact, we have three more just going through now. Of the eight, um, five have either had their first or final closing, and they've raised... How long is that process? Um, the process to go... Our, our program happens in it's sort of one day, and then it's ongoing mentoring after. Is it like a six-month accelerator or it's not ongoing. it's not it's ongoing and um and the timeline is your first fund but you still need a mentorship sure but the timeline i would tell you the timeline for the funds that have gone through and i don't know i can't attribute it to pink light per se but um they their fundraisings have actually gone relatively quickly like prelude and kinsey got to a closing within a year which is yeah. almost unheard of um for any firm women-led or not uh, but of the first eight, five have either had their first or final closing and in aggregate have raised about $400 million, which is great for first time. Most yeah, of them yeah, are yeah, VCs yeah. Or, or growth funds, so they're small. They're, most of them are sub $100 million funds. So it's really been very impressive. And so now we are uh, moving to set one up in Chicago, which no surprise Suzanne is helping with, uh, and we're setting one up in London. So maybe you kind of take a step back a little bit when you look at your career over the 20 plus years, um, what will you be most proud of in your entire career? Um, I will be most proud of if we have the result of having more firms run by women and people of color and successful firms. You know, one of my proudest moments of my career was actually seeing someone else celebrated, which was Robert Smith from Vista Equity on the cover of Forbes magazine as the wealthiest African American uh, in the country. You know, I was one of Robert's first institutional investors. And from the moment I met him, I just knew he was a rock star. And um, I, I, you know, I was involved in giving him an award um, uh, at SEO one year and I said you know it's it's great to have friends that you really love to be with but it's rare that your friends make you money <laughs> so <laughs> it's great to have a friend who makes you money but for somebody like Robert to be one of the top performing private equity managers in the country where a decade ago nobody even knew Vista but because he was given a chance um, that kind of breakthrough and what he's been able to do, not just in terms of success for his limited partners like us and others, but also all the work he does to support women. He's a big supporter of Girls Who Invest. He's a big supporter of other, of Twigo and SEO. Um, I mean, the knock on effect of giving that one guy a chance is extraordinary. And I, the same thing's going to happen with women. You're going to see you know, people like Holly Haynes at Luminate or Adele Oliva at 1315 Capital. I mean, they're going to be on that cover too. They're going to, you're going to see women-led firms that have had that same kind of extraordinary success. And so for me, it's, it's really going to be um, the highlight of my career when I can celebrate all of More these other of people. Yeah, absolutely. And what is your one request of the private equity community to... Like if, the, if you had one specific request for the private equity and just finance community, what would that be? My request would be, you know, get your hands on um, the best practices and guidelines that were developed as part of this women's initiative for the AIC and NAIC. It's available on their websites. You know, pick them up and do your best to integrate those into your firm. You know, implement them. LPs are going to start asking you, just like they did with the ILPA principles, they're going to start asking you, where are you on integrating the, the best practices around uh, the women's initiative? Um, but I promise you, it will make you a better firm, even, and it will prepare you to bring in a much more culturally and ethnically and gender diverse workforce. It will make you more competitive. Um, and we've given you the tools. They're there. <laughs> They're free. Um, so please go ahead. And that would make me very happy if the private equity industry would do that.